Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our May 7th media update. Uh, we're glad to have the help of Deanne Dierondrad and Kevin Culp as our interpreters here today. You're going to hear from Interim City Manager Adam Laughlin in a moment, followed by the Mayor, and then we'll take questions to each of them. We've got a number of reporters online. Same drill as usual. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. S Deputy City Manager. Interim City Manager. Thanks. Thanks, Katrin, and good afternoon. Thanks again for being here today. Uh, I'd like to begin by um, telling everyone how proud I am of the people of Edmonton and the staff at the City of Edmonton. Over the past few challenging months, Edmontonians have worked together in an attempt to flatten the curve of COVID-19, all while physically staying apart. The good news is our collective efforts appear to be working. In Edmonton, we have seen the number of COVID cases rise only incrementally over the past few weeks. Any family supporting a sick family member faces a challenge, but as a community, there is some good news in the trend. We're also seeing people practice physical distancing while outside, enjoying our streets and our parks. We are seeing good compliance with mask gatherings restrictions across the city, as well as with non-essential business closures. And with the number of businesses looking at the potential of reopening as part of stage one of the province's relaunch strategy, we must continue to be vigilant to ensure there are no outbreak spikes. To ensure we continue to have flexibility to manage the delivery of city services within the public health requirements, the state of local emergency will remain in place for an additional week. We will be working in lockstep with the province as we move into the relaunch phase. Right now, there are a number of practical operational questions the province uh, still needs to provide details on, but we're working closely with them to um, uh, obtain that specific guidance. In the meantime, the city has developed five principles that will guide our relaunch activities in the coming weeks. As we make the decisions, we will work to be evidence-based and strategically informed so that we are aligned with the provincial strategy and with the best public health information we're gonna be methodical in stage so that we take an incremental uh, approach in the right direction and we can pause if circum cer certain circumstances require it. We're gonna be resourced and clear so that we have people and budgets in place for the services that are being delivered. We're gonna monitor and be adaptable so that we can uh, make further changes if we need to and responsive and effective so that we're working with the community partners to ensure that we're uh, doing this in a responsive and effective way. These are principles driving our decisions, and there are also a number of questions that will help us determine the practical elements of how and when we should relaunch a program, restart a service, or reopen a venue, such as can we relaunch while still complying with the provincial health orders? Can we afford to relaunch given some of the new economic realities we're facing? Can we dial back the relaunch if health conditions change? and are, are our partners in a position to support our relaunch efforts. There are a lot of elements to consider and we will be thorough in navigating through this. Additional details about our relaunch strategy will be presented at the next Emergency Advisory Committee on May 13th. We imagine that, that we will look at it in four stages of our work, open, watch, evaluate, and recalibrate. Many citizens, businesses, and organizations have reached out to the city to ask how they can help those that are impacted by COVID-19. They want to provide support where it's needed most, and we want to help. We have created a website where you can find information on how to support local organizations that take care of our, most, our city's most vulnerable. There is also information on how you can help local businesses that are struggling through these unprecedented times. The website is called Edmonton Gives. And the idea behind it is to provide a trusted source of information for community members to connect, engage, and donate to organizations working to support others during the COVID-19 pandemic. For anyone wishing to support the COVID-19 response and recovery efforts, please visit the web website at edmonton.ca backslash Edmonton Gives. It's clear that the pandemic has not changed the compassion and care Edmontonians have toward their community and each other. 
We know there is a lot of interest among Edmontonians about when our city-owned golf courses will be open, and I'm pleased to share with you that we will open two of our golf courses. Victoria and Riverside will be opening on Monday, May 11th. Due to financial implications of COVID-19, which, which have reduced service levels across the organization, Rundle, golf, Rundle Park Golf Course will remain closed for the duration of the summer season. Regular food and beverage services will not be available at golf courses upon opening, and their, role, their return will depend on the guidance that we receive from the provincial government. Golfers will be able to book a tee time through the city's uh, Move, Learn, Play registration website starting at 8 a.m. Monday, May 11th. The City of Edmonton continues to roll back restrictions on off-leash dog parks. Lauderdale Dog Park, the largest fenced dog park in Edmonton, uh, reopened this morning. And while we made the decision to reopen this location, we did so while identifying additional ways to prevent virus transmission. That's why for the time being, we are not refilling dog bag dispensers in off-leash dog parks. Dog park users should bring their own bags and please pick up after their pet. They should also clean their hands after they visit, especially if they've touched gates and latches, which we are not sanitizing. We also want people to continue to practice safe physical distancing while using outdoor spaces like off-leash off dog parks. The three other fenced um, dog parks in the city will remain closed at this time while we monitor the performance at Lauderdale in terms of physical distancing um, before we determine the next steps in the other parks. If you've spent some time outside lately, and I hope you have, you'll likely have noticed that the construction season is ramping up on the streets of Edmonton. This work is critical to keeping our roads, bridges, facilities, parks, and neighborhoods in good condition while balancing the need for new infrastructure. We also understand that the impacts of construction will be felt differently this year with many more Edmontonians spending their days at home and off the roads. As much as possible, the city is working to minimize the impacts to citizens and keep them informed during construction. Now more than ever, I want to thank Edmontonians for their support and patience during the construction season. If you live in the Oliver neighborhood, you may have noticed that we've introduced our first shared street in that area. Uh, shared streets are another example of how the city is providing Edmontonians with areas to move safely and practice physical distancing outdoors while staying close to home. Shared streets are open to, for people to walk, bike, and drive along them. And because everyone is using the sh same shared space, the speed limit on these streets is reduced to 20 kilometers per hour to ensure everyone's safety. Vehicle access is restricted to local traffic only on the shared streets and we'll be looking at implementing more shared streets throughout the city in coming days. Uh, for exact locations, you can find that on our website at edmonton.ca slash COVID-19. There are a number of city amenities and services that are typically provided during summer months that unfortunately they won't be available this, available this summer. City of Edmonton outdoor pools and spray parks, including the City Hall Fountain and the ponds at, at Rundle Park will be included in the recovery planning and will likely remain closed for the 2020 summer season. This measure has been taken as part of the city's expenditure reduction strategy. We are looking at the neighborhood playground, uh, playground program, our, our Green Shacks, uh, YEG youth program sites and events, and the summer leaders and training program to determine what's possible in light of the province's reopening plans. We are also looking at other summer, summer programming, including day camps and city facilities to determine whether they can open safely within the provincial guidelines. Day camps planned at community league and social partner sites will not be offered. Clearly our role is to balance what's possible financially for the city with what's permitted by the province. And finally, a message to Edmontonians. It's truly inspiring to see all of the ways you are supporting each other. From the Edmontonians who cheer and clap for our frontline workers every evening at 7 p.m. to the children who are coloring creative thank you messages to our essential workers. You are all making a difference. I know this pandemic and everything that comes with it is incredibly difficult, but we'll, we'll be happy to get through this together and uh, I'll now turn it over to the mayor for his comments.
safety first. Um, <clears throat> as Adam mentioned in today's uh, conversation, there will be many stops and starts as we move forward with our plans. And we know everyone is keen on hearing all the details of exactly what reopening will look like, and more info will be forthcoming over the next week. But for us, the most important objective remains keeping Edmontonians safe. This is why we'll be cautious while reopening and continue to focus on scientific information provided by AHS because we don't want to see any unnecessary outbreaks in COVID-19 cases when Edmonton has been doing so well so far. Now we also spoke today about the need to get some further direction from the province on some of its relaunch strategy. They have not yet provided the level of detail that enables as much clarity as we would like and we do think it is a dangerous road for it to be left up to each municipality to determine its own public health restrictions. As of course we've learned, this virus is not constrained to municipal borders, and so clear and consistent guidelines across Alberta, and particularly for our region, are needed to keep Albertans safe. I have been speaking to other regional and Alberta-wide mayors and our communities all seem to find ourselves in a similar position, and they, like us, are seeking clarity from the province. Now, the truth is we all need more and clearer guidance for business owners and patrons so that they may each manage pandemic risks appropriately and consistently, consistently as they re-engage with the economy. Now, we don't want to wind up at odds with the province or businesses who are desperate to open up, but we do need to make sure that we're all keeping our residents as safe as possible. And so over the next week, we'll be working very hard and very closely uh, with Alberta Health Services to make things crystal clear for our residents and our businesses. So thank you all for your patience, your ongoing patience in this regard. Now, you also heard Adam speak earlier about construction projects moving ahead in our city. And we are advancing projects to help Edmontonians, to keep Edmontonians working during these unprecedented time. And in fact, now is the best time to get some of this work done while some facilities are closed and when roads are less busy. And each of these product, projects, most importantly, creates needed jobs and contributes to our economy. But because of this, uh, we know that our capital infrastructure plan is more important than ever as construction activity can be an important boost to not only our local, but provincial and national economy. And so we will come out of this pandemic, and when we do, we know that Edmonton's, Edmontonians will continue to depend on our roads, our bridges, our transit and rail, our facilities and our parks that we're currently building for years to come. Now it's clear that while we can move forward with many of these construction projects this year, we may not be able to keep up that level of investment in future years without help. Edmonton's growing budget pressure remains a top concern for City Council. Essential services like garbage collection, transit and more are funded through our operating budget and we need to balance the urgent need for those operating dollars while still proceeding with infrastructure spending that creates jobs. Now I previously outlined in a letter to the Premier that the City of Edmonton had lots of shovel-ready projects for 2020 and 2021, and combined, the lists that we provided included more than 2.1 billion in stimulus projects that could create over 10,000 jobs and directly benefit people in this region. Now, I do remain hopeful that we will see announcements soon from the government of Alberta, and I hope it's enough to kickstart uh, kick more job growth in the Edmonton metro region. And in that same letter to the Premier, I also stress the fact that Edmonton is and remains in urgent need of a cash flow backstop to help our city relieve the extraordinary revenue and cost hits incurred as a result of this pandemic. Residents and businesses have told us that delaying property tax helps, but might not be enough support for some of them. But the city is not in a position to forgive property tax payments, even on a targeted basis, and still provide Edmontonians with the essential services that they need. And so this is why we continue to advocate to both the provincial and federal governments for financial assistance. Financial support that allows for a delay in property tax collection or even a one-time targeted or general reduction will put much needed money back in the hands of businesses and households, providing immediate economic stimulus and supporting Alberta's economic reset. Edmontonians cannot and should not have to shoulder the burden 
of massive property tax levies that could run up in future years, 2021 and beyond, to help keep essential services running if provincial and or federal financial backstop is not provided. One of the places we would have to cut back would be the very infrastructure spending that would create the jobs that we're trying to protect. So we don't want to wind up in that austerity position. And so on that point, I have another call with the Deputy Prime Minister and uh, uh, Big City Mayor's Caucus of Canada tomorrow to continue to press this issue uh, with the federal government. And we will also continue to press this matter with the provincial government. But with that, happy to take your questions. Thank you. We'll go to the reporters. We have five online and one in the room. Go ahead, uh, Jeremy, in the room. Uh, I have to applaud us going to start us off a little off topic here. Um, you mentioned the, the, the trouble with the expenses and money during this. There's a report going to council next week about the police, uh, Northwest Police uh, HQ. Uh, city staff are recommending you need to replace the entire roof on that structure and it would require uh, $8 million in borrowing to do so. Um, I don't know if you're able to comment on, on, on that, if you've read the report yet, or anything you can say about it. I haven't had the just came out today while we were in the other meeting, so I, uh, I, I can't speak to something I haven't read yet. Uh, I, I know that we are going to try to recover some of those costs, but uh, I can't get into the details necessarily at this time of, of how we're going to do that. But if Adam wants to supplement. No, that's all Adam wants to say at this point, too, is that we, we are looking to recover some of those costs. Uh, um, uh, but yeah, we'll have more to say next week once we've seen the report. We'll go next, please, to uh, Natasha Reeve online. Natasha, go ahead, please. Are you with us, Natasha? I'll go in the meantime. Oh, you're there. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Hi, thank you. Um, I thought, jeez, okay. No I'm um, just wondering about, there is a lot of concern about the reopening of restaurants and cafes. And Adam, I know that uh, we've, the whole way along here, we're following AHS guidelines. But is there anything we can, you can do um, in the meantime to try to prepare for that reopening? Uh, thanks for the question, Tasha. Uh, what we can do is... Uh, uh, is what we are doing actually is to really work with our provincial partners to get more clarity around specific protocols or or guidelines associated with some of the stage one reopening and and some of the discussion today um, was was another example of what we could be doing which is uh, engaging with our, our business improvement areas and and who they represent to see if there's ways that we can potentially enable uh, greater space requirements to adhere to the restrictions that will still be in place um, as part of the stage one relaunch. So still two meter physical distancing and still um, a restriction in terms of occupancy. Um, so those are the things that we're doing is we're, um, we're in a preparation phase, but certainly we'd like more clarity from the province in terms of specific guidelines for some of those specific businesses like restaurants. Natasha, did you have a follow up? Please, thank you. But, uh, you know, it was raised, uh, sorry, I can't remember which councillor raised it, I think it was Andrew Knack, the idea of allowing more space or uh, giving restaurants, cafes, the ability to expand their space onto a street, that kind of thing. Could the city not start looking at that right away? So that is what we're assessing. So when I mentioned uh, sort of the discussions with the BIAs, it is looking at that potential. And we just have to balance that with uh, the space that's needed to accommodate vehicles and pedestrians, especially in, in light of the two meter physical distancing that's required. So it's just making sure that we uh, provide the appropriate space for all uh, when we're considering that. So it is something that um, we are looking at. And again, um, if we can get greater details from the province, uh, then we're in a better position to pursue the potential to use additional outdoor space to support uh, uh, restaurants. I'm going to go next to Keith at the Edmonton Journal. Go ahead, please, Keith. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a question for the mayor. I uh, wanted to pick up on some of the comments you made about municipal funding. Uh, you certainly talked about how the pandemic has exposed 
the vulnerability of municipalities financially and that the time has come to maybe have a conversation about how municipalities should have access to more elastic forms of revenue, not just the one-time backstop, but kind of ongoing operational funding. I'm wondering if you can kind of elaborate on that. What kinds of elastic funding sources might be on the table or should be on the table? Well, I, I think it starts from the premise that how we paid for things going into this may not work going forward. Uh, for governments who can run much greater deficits and who have the fiscal room to do that and sort of borrow against the future, um, against the hope of recovery that's going to refill those coffers, that's, that's a more attractive and viable option. Um, but that doesn't really work for us because property tax doesn't grow in the same way that income tax or sales tax or other business taxes uh, grow. And so as our primary source of revenue, I think 57% of our operating budget is, uh, is property tax. The rest is user fees. And even those user fees, we tend to have to adjust uh, annually for inflation as well because they're not direct, they don't directly track the growth of the economy. So uh, I was on a call earlier today with um, um, a lot of mayors in the United States who were talking about the hits to uh, the income taxes that they collect, the sales taxes that they collect, and how the, the loss of those during this downturn is devastating for them, but at least when things recover, they'll get those back. Um, uh, so they're able to bet on the future, and they're also interested in the rebound of their businesses because they get direct revenues off the business activity, not just the property itself. Um, and of course, we're as interested in the support uh, in the in the, the thriving of our businesses and our households. But there's no direct relationship between the health of the economy and the city. Uh, and um, which really is what supports people's ability to pay from one year to the next, and the principal revenue sources that come to Canadian cities. So uh, this whole issue has really exposed a, a long-standing challenge that Canadian municipalities have faced, uh, being overly reliant on, uh, you know, really a feudal form of taxation, if you, if you think about it, um, a land and wealth tax as opposed to a uh, set of revenues that relate to what's actually happening in the economy from one year to the next. So there is an opportunity to reset this as all governments think about how we're going to share the load going forward. With that comes an obligation to also scrutinize our expenditures and we may not be able to turn everything back on that we've turned off. You know, we've heard, you know, it's a small example, but one of our golf courses we're not able to turn back on yet. The others we are and they'll produce enough revenue to cover uh, the fixed costs and and so um, you know we're going to have to be quite selective on the cost side but also uh, really beyond the one-time backstop to deal with the extraordinary hit to our revenues and the extra costs that we've faced there is an opportunity to reset here and uh, give cities uh, a share in the recovery revenue that's what we had in the city charters fiscal framework was a uh, a robust revenue sharing arrangement with the government of alberta that would see uh, the transfer to cities rise with uh, with broader provincial revenues which tap a variety of different forms of income um, so I think longer term, that's a conversation we'd like to have, but it's probably best had after we uh, deal with this backstop uh, issue with the 10 to $15 billion hole in uh, uh, city and, and town and county budgets across the country out to the end of the year. Any follow-up from you, Keith, on that point? Uh, no, no follow-up, thanks very much. Thank you. I'm gonna go next, please, to Vinesh at Global. Vinesh, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, this is a question for the mayor. Uh, you kind of uh, talked about it w with your uh, initial comments. So the province announced stage one relaunch plans last week, um, and it appears uh, the city and municipalities are not getting clear guidance, I guess you, you're, you've indicated. How frustrated um, are you about that, and what are you hoping to see between now and next Wednesday? It's not only uh, cities uh, that have concerns, and obviously we've uh, Adams talked to his colleagues, uh, and I've talked to a number of my colleagues around the province. But it's not just us; uh, we're hearing it from individual businesses who are asking, um, "How can I safely comply with what seem to be contradictory orders? How can I cut hair and stay six feet away?" Uh, is a sort of obvious example, but there are many permutations and combinations within the categories of businesses that have been uh, signaled for May 14th opening. 
Um, we've also had to, uh, you know, look to our own, you know, golf facilities, for example, and figure out how to safely turn those back on, just like private golf courses. So there's clarity around some of those, but for many businesses, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty. And, and uh, you know, from checking, I wouldn't speak for the Chamber of Commerce ever, but from, from having spoken, uh, I checked with my office was in touch with them earlier today. There's great excitement about measures to start economic activity again, but significant confusion and uncertainty. So it's not just municipalities, it's businesses. The challenge for us is uh, if we're expected to enforce guidelines uh, or orders that are not clear, that puts our enforcement people in a very difficult situation and puts the city in between uh, orders uh, um, and rules coming from the province and businesses. We don't want to wind up uh, in, in the middle of that, and that's why the more clarity the government of Alberta can provide um, as guidance to both businesses and to cities about how to support businesses to comply to support public health, the better. And we haven't seen that yet. We hear it's coming. Um, sooner would be better so we can make sure the communication is clear and the training is there for uh, any of our enforcement personnel to be able to do their best work and keep the public patrons and workers at these establishments safe. Vinesh, did you have a follow-up question? Uh, yes, uh, this would be for uh, Adam. Um, Adam, can you just expand upon the uh, the five points related to the uh, the concerns raised around the Expo Center? Uh, what's being done? Uh, if you can reiter reiterate that, and just uh, the monitoring that's uh, underway uh, for additional measures. Uh, so the the five points: um, additional facilities that will be provided and and um, monitored by appropriate uh, uh, social agencies. There is additional. Um, and this, is, this has been happening, the EPS and peace officer uh, monitoring of the LRT station um, is, is another one that's ongoing. Uh, with that, there's also an opening of a facility within the station that will be um, monitored, uh, a washroom facility that will be monitored by one of the agencies. Um, and I'm drawing a blank on the other two. Um, yeah, porta potties. I, I mentioned that, so um, I can circle back with you, Vinesh, on on the five exactly. But essentially, it's uh, increasing a bit of the oversight, providing more facilities. Um, oh, the another one was adjusting shuttle service that we're providing from Kinsman to um, the Expo Center to ensure that we're uh, minimizing. Um, uh, uh, foot traffic between the Expo Center and uh, uh, the Kinsman Center. Um, so, so those are some of the activities that are in place um, so we can uh, help curb some of the challenges that we've experienced at the Expo Center. Adam reiterated four of the five. We'll make sure that you have that fifth one, Vinesh. Thank you. Everyone who's online or in the room has had a round of questions. Are there any closing questions from anyone before we say our goodbyes? Hi, it's Dustin. I haven't been able to ask a question. Oh, I beg your pardon. I missed you, Dustin. Please go ahead. Thank you. I think my question is for the mayor. Uh, I'm wondering, um, without the clarity and requirements laid down by the province, uh, are you concerned that all the businesses said to come online in stage one on the 14th is happening too fast without this coming? Is the city concerned that this is happening too quickly? The city hasn't taken a position, thanks for the question, the city hasn't taken a position on whether reopening should or shouldn't happen on the 14th. That That is the province's call. Uh, the issue is our ability to uh, clearly communicate and also effectively enforce uh, requirements uh, for public health, um, partly as, uh, as a local um, inspection entity and and partly because of the, the broader public health imperative. And so both on a technical basis uh, and on a public safety basis, um, you know, we have deferred to the province uh, for the most part along the way here um, uh, because they've been very forthcoming with information, uh, data, and, and guidelines. Um, we need them to do that very urgently in this case so that we can be up and running in a clear way on the 14th. If that isn't forthcoming between now and then, uh, that, that would create considerable challenges, not just for us, but for the businesses trying to do the right thing, feeling that tension between um, 
wanting to open up and wanting to keep their patrons and their employees safe. Uh, so we want to uh, to be able to be in a position to give that advice uh, to businesses and uh, enforce um, first educate and then enforce on a very clear basis. And uh, uh, so as long as the province can provide us um, that in very short order, um, then at the end of the day, the decision uh, around reopening on the 14th um, would be, you know, deference, deference to their timeline based on the information that they have. If we can't have that guidance and can't have that clarity, then we start to find ourselves in a very difficult position. But I'm not going to speculate about that uh, uh, unless or until that occurs next week. Did you have a follow-up, Dustin? I do. Following up on that, is May 13th, when the update on relaunch is expected to uh, come to Council, cutting it too close? Should these businesses be prepared to open the day after? What's your message to them now? Well, businesses, of course, each get to make this decision for themselves based on um, their own risk management, their own interpretation of the guidelines. And we've certainly heard many businesses that are saying they're not ready to go yet. They don't have sufficient access to PPE to do what they would want to do, uh, and they don't have sufficient guidance. So I think uh, there will be others who say, I have to open because I've got to sort of secure my market position right now. So it's the marketplace will have a response to this, uh, of course. The city's role is, uh, to the extent that we're involved with uh, supporting businesses to do whatever they choose to do, not pressure them one way or the other, uh, that's where we need really clear guidance from the provincial government to be able to educate and answer their questions and then to be able to enforce uh, accordingly. Thank you, Vinesh. We have the fifth of, of those uh, responses to the challenges at Expo. Adam will speak to those for you. And, and we will uh, have an opportunity next week uh, at a number of different council meetings if necessary to deal with this, but we did move up our emergency advisory committee meeting uh, to Wednesday uh, to sort of take one more look at this before things open up on the 14th. So we've got multiple touch points next week, not just the meeting on Wednesday. Adam, complete his answer to you, Vinesh, and then call for any last question. Uh, Vinesh, uh, it was uh, the, the additional porta potties and the washrooms opening, the transit peace officers and EPS continuing their efforts on the LRT station, um, the additional sh shuttle service from the Expo Center, uh, from Kinsman to the Expo Center. Uh, we've also got our EPS and neighborhood empowerment team working together to provide additional support to any encampments that might uh, uh, arise in Borden Park. And we also are working with Alberta Avenue Business Association around Capital City Cleanup uh, and understanding some of the challenges that they're dealing with uh, and, and providing them in for our, our kits or information uh, to help them with that. So those are the five things. Jeremy won the last question lottery and uh, he's going to put his question now. Just a quick clarification question for you on golf courses. Uh, what's different about Rundle? Why open Victoria and uh, Riverside but not Rundle? Uh, Rundle, from a cost perspective, historically has been uh, different than the other two. And so the mayor mentioned, and, and not quite fully recover, um, but covers a lot of the costs associated with uh, the maintenance costs at uh, Victoria and, and Riverside. Not the same at, at Rundle. And so it's really an economic decision. In, in the past, we've also looked at Rundle. Uh, from a program and service review perspective around um, the viability of it or the ongoing viability of it. So that in the context of um, our, our relaunch, recover and reimagine uh, puts us in a position where um, we're, we're making the decision not to open that facility. Thank you everyone. If you have anything you need uh, further clarification on, please be in touch with our media relations folks. They are there and happy to help you. Thanks and good evening.